Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Learning Circle. My name is Shauna Duncan. I'm a Cree and English ancestry, and I want to um, acknowledge that we're uh, working together here on unceded, occupied traditional territory of the Muskegon Nation. And uh, just a disclaimer for before we get started, we do this for all our learning circles now. Due to sensitive subject matter and the stories shared during the UBC Learning Circle sessions, participants may become uh, upset or triggered. Please ensure you have prepared a support system for yourself in advance and which you have easy access to. This could mean an elder, a trusted mentor, friend, family, counselor, uh, and or a crisis number. So again, it's so good to have you here and today we're going to be having, uh, we're doing something on mindfulness, tools for restoring balance and we have two very special guests. Of course, a repeat guest for us is Denise. And we have a new guest also, so this is Denise Finley, and it's Indrani. <laughs> I had to practice her name, she told me just their name earlier. But maybe you two would like to introduce yourself to everybody. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I hope uh, some of you recognize me out there. It's so good. Thank you for having us back, or and having me back again. It's, I've been here quite a few times. Um, my name is Denise Finley and I belong to the Squamish Nation where I live on reserve actually just across Lionsgate Bridge in North Vancouver with my family there. Um, <clears throat> and I own a, a consulting business called Kui Kui Consulting so for the past 14 or some odd years I've been traveling around mostly BC but other parts of Canada as well working with um, organizations and communities in different contexts. Uh, as a facilitator, but generally going in to do work in the area of group facilitation, wellness, healing, um, relationship building, and whatnot. So um, when this opportunity came up uh, to come back and talk about um, mindfulness and ways of, I guess, coping and, and creating what we want in our life, I was really excited because Last year I actually met Indrani, she was one of my professors at uh, SFU as I was, um, I'm just at the tail end of a master's degree in education with a focus on contemplative inquiry and approaches and uh, it was kind of interesting how it all unfolded because uh, she was carrying around uh, a book with her. She was teaching us uh, about embodiment and aesthetic ed education and she was carrying around this book with her. Now it wasn't recommended reading but her copy of this book had little tags and things on it and I saw her referring to it a lot. Now, what is that book? I, I got curious and what I did is I actually I took a picture of it when she wasn't looking and then I went <laughs> online and I ordered it and I read it. Um, and then I started to, to utilize the meditation and visualization practices that are contained in the book. Uh, and I, I, all, I could sense an immediate difference in my being and the way I was carrying myself in the world. And so it's been about a year that I've been uh, utilizing these practices. And uh, just before Christmas, uh, I, my life took an interesting turn and I was, um, and I'm still sort of dealing with some very heavy personal issues that um, I think without uh, this as, a, as a, a foundation for me, I'm not sure I would be handling with it with as much grace as I am. So it's really, it's really carried me through um, hugely. So, uh, and we're going to be talking to you about um, the contents of this book and about the author of this book and his teachings as we go today. We'll introduce him to you in a moment. Uh, but I want to give Indrani a chance to, to introduce herself as well. She's an amazing um, uh, person, individual, and uh, educator. And, I, and I've learned so much from her as well. And a good, a good friend also. Thank you, Denise. You're welcome. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, I am so happy to be here with you all today. So thank you for coming and listening to us. Uh, my name is Indrani Margolin and I'm a professor at the University of Northern British Columbia in social work. Um, I uh, was born and raised in Toronto and I lived there up until 2008 and then in 2009 I moved to Prince George to uh, work with UNBC 
And then in 2014, I moved down to the Lower Mainland here to run a cohort for the Bachelor of Social Work program for UNBC at Langara College. So I've been in Vancouver for a year and a half now, and um, I love living here. My, uh, my main interest in teaching, in research, in working community is mind, body, and spirit balance. It's the whole the holistic teaching of our being. And I work with the arts and the meditation in service of this wholeness and this unity. I learned about the creative power of thought uh, from a teacher, Mr. Tulshi Sen, um, who wrote this book that Denise already talked about. And from those teachings, he taught me how to calm my mind and transform my self-image from one that was dictated to me by my past to one that I truly desire from within my own heart. So Mr. Sen is quite incredible. He has worked with First Nations communities coast to coast across Canada and internationally. And he's also taken youth from communities um, to the great halls of Hong Kong and China and Taiwan. And it is, um, it's these teachings that Denise and I are learning from him that we are really excited about and that we want to talk to you about today. I teach a, um, I teach a spirituality and social work class and because I have recognized the deep need uh, for helpers to have self-care, I have dedicated the first half hour of every class to meditation and self-care. And I'm also doing some research to document students' experiences. And what I've been learning from them is, I'll just tell you a few short stories. One woman suffered from incredible social anxiety and she found with this meditation work her physical symptoms really reduce so her palms aren't as sweaty she doesn't shake as much she's not as nervous going in exams she enjoys driving suddenly another woman said she can find herself sleeping she works night shifts in the social services and she can actually fall asleep quicker and relax her mind another student said um, I can't live without this meditation. It's just like exercise, I need it to function. So it has a really um, profound impact on the people that are practicing it. And we wanna just begin to introduce some of this work to you today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great, thank you. I, I loved everything that you said there, it's amazing. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so we're gonna take you through um, we're going to take, take you through, um, we're going to share with you some sort of theoretical pieces around how the self-image is formed um, and how to create the self-image you want and then to start to vision uh, and, and use meditation and visualization to start to um, think the thoughts we want to think so that we can create the conditions we want to, we want to really have in our life and so I know many people come to you're coming to this session or you're viewing this session because you know we live in a crazy world we live in a busy world and people have a huge so many demands and, and we're all going through sort of different crises at different times and so um, this this is going to give you something to work with to help you manage the anxiety or or the stress or you know, sometimes there's sadness or hopelessness or despair, I mean, depending on what you're going through. So this is, it's incredibly powerful. Mr. Sen is a brilliant teacher. He has changed my life and my husband's life. It's been a gift to have him come in. So I wanna make sure we honor um, uh, where the teachings come from. And this particular form of meditation is called Mahavakya meditation um, that, that Mr. Sen has made accessible to the general pop population, basically. Yeah. Uh, and it's incredibly powerful. And Mahavakyam is a Sanskrit word, and uh, it means the great word meditation. There's there's four proclamations, and 
It, that's literally the translation, the great words meditation. Very potent. So we're going to do a little bit of talking, and then we're going to break for questions and answers. And um, so, so people will be able to type in their questions to you, Sean, and yes. sort of help us track all of that. Uh, but it really is our hope that you you take something valuable away today that you can you can enact. Um, and we'll also provide more information about the book and uh, the meditation CD that's available. And Indrani and I, just so you know, I'll just plant the seed, is we're planning on doing a two-day workshop sometime mm -hmm. in the future. So if people are interested, um, our contact information is on the last slide of, okay, of the yeah. presentation. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think, too, the other thing that's important uh, to mention is that uh, Indigenous lifeways are, are founded on relationality and unity. and, and a, a conviction that everything is connected and that we're all one and everything has life from the stones to the to the oceans to the animals uh, to us and that we're all connected and so one of the reasons that this is such a beautiful um, meditation to work with uh, and a process to work with is that it for me as an indigenous woman it's it spoke to my core belief system mm -hmm. about what is and it felt most natural and I think that's probably why Mr. Sen has been able to work so effectively with Indigenous people with that. So similar both of you. Very yes. much so. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, with that, I think we'll dive, we'll dive into the presentation. We have a lot of slides to get through, so we, we need to be, I guess, efficient, but also giving value. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK. So would you like to start with the agenda? Sure. Yeah, we're gonna we're going to t first of all talk about self-image, how it's formed, how it limits us, um, and how we can break the chains that have held us captive. We're going to talk about creating a self-image and a vision for our life that we truly desire and inspires action. We're going to talk about strategies to help uh, center ourselves and think the thoughts that will extinguish self-doubt and lead to the manifestation of our visions. Doesn't that sound great? <laughs> um, and the relationality and unity of an indigenous way of life, which is really uh, foundational to this this meditation and visualization. And then we're you know we'll we'll have time for Q. Q and A and answering yeah. questions as we go. We want to keep you engaged. And yeah. So if you can type in your questions at any time, and as soon as we take a break, then um, I'll bring the questions up for you. So feel free, just type away whenever a thought comes to mind. Awesome. Okay. We um, can go to the next, the next slide. Can I control that here? Yes. Shana? Oh, excellent. I should know that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to first just spend a moment on this word catastrophe before we really get into our presentation because catastrophe is uh, something that we all experience and um, causes many of us distress. Um, but the meaning of the word is really interesting and in English, cat means turning point. So we often feel like a catastrophe is the end when we feel an experience with such a sense of, of grief or loss or, or something sudden that jars us and is painful. We suddenly feel that's the end for us. It's the end of the world. We know it. But the meaning of the word actually means turning point. So while a catastrophe causes tremendous change, and comes with an immediate sense of pain, there's also an opening. It, it can be a crack opening, or it can also be considered like a spiritual crisis. And in that spiritual crisis, we can crack open to something new. And there's something beautiful that can be waiting for us, where it's not the end for us, it's the beginning of something new. So we just wanted to begin our presentation with this idea in mind. That's great. So, and, and I, it, it, yeah, it's, it, what this can, what this uh, method of, uh, this way of meditating and visualizing can do is basically it, the meditation itself, the way I would describe it uh, and the way that I've been taught by Mr. Sen is that the meditation itself 
helps us to tap into, get behind our mind and tap into that infinite potential that we all really have mm -hmm. access to. Um, the mind is, is um, considered to be a measure. That's what it, not mind comes from the word, measure comes mm -hmm. from the word mind. And so our mind is basically what finitizes the infinite. And so if we can use the meditation to get behind the mind to tap into the infinite possibility and then use the visioning to start to shape um, our thoughts so that we can create what we want in our life. That's really what we're talking about with this. And it's, inc it's incredible, incredibly powerful. And it really is. I, I, love, I love how I've heard Mr. Sensei uh, a few times that... Our world is moving so fast that even when we go to university and we, you know, whatever we study in university, that that um, information often becomes obsolete pretty quick. We all know that, and we're always having to learn new things. But the mind, if we can work with um, developing our mind in this way, that is the most invaluable, the invaluable thing, tool that we have, really. Yeah, like long run. It, it's absolutely. Then we can we can overcome the obstacles. We can we can manifest the results we want. That put that empowers us. We don't have to be a victim of our circumstances anymore. Mm -hmm. And for me, this has been hugely liberating. Yes. Um, and we'll talk more about this as we go. And really, I'll just add to that really great explanation of Denise that. The important piece about mind being the measure is that mind is not what decides. It just measures. It's our consciousness mm -hmm. that is the decider of our life. And the mind is just there to measure, to choose between this or that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm gonna, we're going to move on now to sort of talk about self-identity and how we need to really take a look at uh, and understand how our identity is formed mm -hmm. um, before we can really start to think the thoughts that we want to think because of the conditioning that we experience growing up and how that that often, I know for me, and I'll speak mm -hmm. for myself, is that the way I was raised, it, it limited what my mind believed was possible and not possible. And so it's about understanding how that process works so that we can transform it. And it's incredibly powerful. So the first question we need to ask is, who am I? <laughs> <laughs> who am I? When we say who am I, we're asking, what is my capacity? What can I do? This question drives us. And this is the very question that drives our life. Even to get into our computer, they ask a password, why? Because they want to know who, who it is yeah, that's coming. User. Who is the user? So who am I? And we, when we ask this, we're interviewing ourselves. And this is a constant process of asking, who is this I? When we look in the mirror and we look into those eyes, who is that I reflecting back mm -hmm. when we look? Who is that? The next question we would ask is, what am I doing here? This question bothers many people because we don't stop to often ask that question. We get up, we go to work, we come back, we make dinner, we put the kids to bed, we go to sleep, we occasionally go for a vacation, then we go through life like this, and then we retire. We need to stop and ask ourselves these questions to really know where is here. The next question is where is here, this location. We're always living in our being. Here is in our consciousness. We are eternal. We are here and now and what we see outside is a reflection of what is inside. And what is inside is a reflection of what is outside. The next question um, that we have to ask is, uh, where, where am I going to? Um, and we have to, we have to keep asking that question over and over in order to find our purpose and to have mm -hmm. a purpose. And I think when we are 
that dynamic that Indrani was talking about where we are just, and I know we all can relate to this, where it just feels like the mundane. We get up, we eat our breakfast, we take our kids to school, we work, we come home, we, you know, and occasionally we plan for this vacation. Um, that it can feel a little, like what is my purpose here? And I know for myself, not having purpose has often been the root of a lot of my anxiety in life. And so when we ask ourselves, where am I going? We start to we start to reflect on well, what is my purpose? And it is so important to find that. Um, we should be haunted by those questions really on a daily basis, contemplating them, and because without them, it's we can fall into those habits of just being on autopilot. I, how many times that I can remember in the past driving to work and um, have you ever driven to work and you, you get there and you don't remember the drive in? Yeah. <laughs> and you think, how did I get here? <laughs> and you're, mo you're just you know, floating out in all the, all the minutia and the details and the tasks and whatnot. Uh, it's, it's very powerful. So where am I going? What is my purpose here? And actually, I'm going to go back and I'm going to say them all just in a row. Who am I? These are the questions. Who am I? What am I doing here? Where is here in our being? Where am I going to? What is my purpose here? And why do I do the things that I do the way that I do it? Now most people don't ask themselves those questions. We just grow up, we are given a set of conditions by society and our parents, and we just, we just carry on without ever reflecting. And so this is an opportunity for daily reflection and daily contemplation. And what we would recommend, and what Mr. Sam recommends, is get a journal and write these questions in that journal. And every single day, meditate and reflect on these particular questions for yourself. Just ask yourself, each and every day, those questions and, and write your answers down in, in your journal. That's a, it's a wonderful um, place to start and it is a deeply, you know, it's a deeply personal discussion with yourself. And I, I just have to say I'm trying to pass these, these ways of being to my children early on um, so that they don't have to suffer the way I have in life to come to these things through catastrophe necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to have this, these capacities before they start to meet the, ca the catastrophes of their <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when we ask these questions, what we're really doing is we're establishing a vision for our life. We're starting that process of um, what do I want? in my life. Yes. Yeah. And we're also establishing a relationship with who we are mm. in addition to that vision, which is so important, right? It, that's the core. It's a yeah. core piece. Yeah. These, this is the most important discussion you'll ever have with the most important person in your life, which is you. These questions, when we know the answer to these questions, imagine knowing the clear answer to these questions it eradicates fear in us. It eradicates fear. Mm -hmm. Because when we know who we are, we become fearless. Mm -hmm. I love, I, one of the ways that meditation works as well is that um, it's like water wearing on a mountainside. And so when we ask questions repeatedly in this way and we focus on them, or we focus on a particular meditation, and this, this meditation I would consider to be the ultimate meditation because for many years I tried to meditate and it was only when I found this particular method I really understood what, what meditation could do for me. The other, the other ones I had tried didn't really work all that well. But it, the mind gets tired, you see. And so when we're able to tire the mind out in that way, that's when we can tap into our consciousness and our infinite potential and that's where we can manifest change from. And that is the magic of meditation and visualization is that drip, drip, drip like water on a mountain and there's, you know, eventually that water is going to a roadbound mountainside. And so that, think of meditation and visualization and posing those questions to yourself as that water drip, drip, dripping on your mind and, and wearing away. Yes.
Water resists nothing, and yet nothing can resist the power of water. Such a beautiful metaphor for what our consciousness is. And if we can, with these tools, allow our consciousness to reveal who we are to ourselves, we can discover why we're here and what we want in this world and what's most precious to us, really precious, deep in our heart that we keep secret. And we have the power to bring that out. It's beautiful. So the purpose of all of this is to create a self-image, the self-image that we want. Because um, our self-image really makes us what we are how we perceive ourselves, what we believe about ourselves, the values and uh, about, um, I mean, I reflect on my, my own life and, at some of the, and I'm shedding, I'm, I'm shedding some of these, these ways of being uh, through this process of, of contemplation and meditation and visualization that, um, that those things that have been passed on to me in childhood don't necessarily have to or even society, we, that doesn't have to be. That's that doesn't have to be what our identity is based on. That we can get behind that. And I love this. Um, I love this quote uh, by Emerson: uh, "What we are, that only can we see. What we are, that only can we see. And so our identity, it's like a filter through which we see the world. And our identity." Um, the way I would describe it is it, it, it allows us to see certain things in a certain way and it disallows other things. Uh, and a good example is, you know, if we were all looking at a plant or a tree, we would all see something different. If we were to go around a circle of people and we were all to look at the same object, each person would see something different as they, as they took that object in. And we would see it based on our own I, our identity and our own filter and what that how that shapes what we see and it's so it's working we must work with the identity um, and I want to connect it back to why I know why people you know are, are viewing this this session is when people are dealing with anxiety and stress and all of these sorts of things um, but unless we sort of get to the root and we, we change our self-identity, um, and I know this to be true in my own life, I, managing my stress is very different than actually becoming a person who doesn't feel stressed. And so we have, again, asking what we want. Do I want to be managing my stress, or do I actually want to live a life where I'm not experiencing the stress anymore? So this, help, this, this method helps us get to that root. And so starting with the self-identity is so important. Your self-image makes you what you are. The sum total of your beliefs and memory, understanding, and knowledge. So we must ask these questions over and over again until the mind gets tired. So we can create something new. Do you have anything you want to add, Andrani? I think what you said about um, allowing when we what we allow in um, also creates a disallowance of other things, and I think that that's such a key point um, because um, the word yoga means unity or union. It also means to add, and the word biyoga means to subtract and to enter a state of unity or yoga, we have to also engage in bi yoga. But it's a natural process that happens that when we unite with what we want, we disengage from what we don't want. We create a new awareness, a new consciousness within ourselves. And I just think of that notion that you talked about is so important between what we allow in terms of our self-image naturally creates a disallowance uh, moving away from that which isn't serving us in our life. Absolutely. 
So I am the self-image that Denise and I are talking about. We're talking about our I amness, our beingness. I am are the two most important words in the English language. It's so significant to start attending to what we say after I am. And Denise and I practice this and uh, we suggest you also try this, that it's such a powerful thing to engage in to either speak with someone you're with or write in your journal the sentence I am and just frolic in your heart. What would you like to be? I am a great teacher. I am a great parent. And I am proclaims right now, not I want to be a great teacher sometime then, I am this. And it's amazing just the words I am, what that transformation can do to your consciousness right now. You can just feel, feel the difference in, in the body. It's incredible. And so uh, we practice this a lot and it helps us tremendously focusing on what it is that we are because as Emerson said, we cannot be anything we're not. To be what we want to be, we backwardly have to be it first. <laughs> and it seems really strange and backwards, but that's the way it works. Mm. It's, it's, Mr. Sen calls it backwards living, living <clears throat> from the vision first. We often think, oh, I can be happy. I can get what I want when my circumstances allow it. Mm. No, that's not, that's not how it works mm. because our circumstances reflect like a mirror our inner vision. That's the way creation works from the inside out. Can I just tell, I want to just tell a little story about my son. I Absolutely. told you the other day, um, I was driving my nine-year-old son to school and his dad has been dealing with some, some illness and uh, as we were driving, uh, this, a song came on the radio that we really love, Cake by the Ocean. It's very popular right now, so most of you may have heard it. And so I turned the song up and I said, you know, Jake, I said, when, when dad's all better, we're going to go to Hawaii and we're going to have a big celebration and we're all going to dance. This is my vision. We're all going to dance on the ocean to Kate. We're going <laughs> to play the song Cake by the Ocean and we're going to dance in the sand. And my son, who's nine, very pragmatic, a little wise old soul, but he says, I'll believe it when I see it. And uh, there's the conditioning coming in. And so I said, okay. I said, well, I said, you know, I said, no, no, that, you got it all backwards. You got it all backwards. And I could see he, his innocent little soul, he's, hmm, he was interested. And I said, actually, that's not how it works. I said, you will see it when you believe. And you could just see the little wheels turning in his head. And I thought, okay, I've planted that seed because that is so important that he has the belief first, that his identity um, is founded on this belief in his own self to create circumstances and manifest results in his life. That's the biggest gift I can give my children. It's the biggest gift any, we, we all have access to this. I wanted to tell that story because it was so, it was just so sweet. It was so sweet. Yeah. The answers is your self-image, which is your power source. You are totally dependent on your self-image for everything you do. This is your unfailing dependency. Our goals, our visions, our aspirations, our response image, all of it is directly limited to our self-image. It's our paradigm. It's the glasses through which we see the world. It is the filter through which we see the world. We all look at one tree. We see absolutely different things. Wood, shelter, birds, a rainforest, a place to gather with friends. Every view is different, and that is what our self-image is, like colored glasses. Mm. So this work is about making those glasses the color we want. Mm. How do we want to see the world? What color do we want to see? There will be a filter, always. 
but how about we make the filter the filter we want, not the filter that has been dictated to us by those around us that also don't know yet about this power of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I, I think about, as I hear you say that, I think about all, all of the children in our communities that are receiving the, the overdiagnosis of mental health issues um, and mental health problems, uh, anxiety disorders, and suicide. And um, mo many communities will say they're in a state of crisis right now. Uh, but to give our children the power of choice, that's empowerment. That is personal empowerment. And that, that doesn't necessarily come. We can, you know, we can be very educated, and education is very important, but that doesn't necessarily give us the freedom of knowing that we have a choice about how we want to see ourselves, how we want to see the world. And that, I think, is the biggest gift that, that and, I, and I think children really, like my son at nine, he got that. He, he got that right away. So it's very, very powerful. <clears throat> so what we are, that only we can see. It's a beautiful quote. Um, and remember that the self-image is a filter that we, that, that we um, believe, that all of our beliefs um, are filtered through that self-image, and um, the meditation system and visualization system helps us get underneath the mind, to get behind it, and to um, create that identity that we want to create. Uh, otherwise, and I have had this sense before, otherwise it can sometimes feel like we're faking it. Have you ever felt that way in life? So we're trying to be confident, or we're trying to not be stressed, or we're trying for something, but deep down inside, it, that transformation hasn't quite yet taken place. And I know, I know I've grappled with that myself. I think we all do as human beings. So again, looking at the self-identity, uh, first step in this process to um, transforming ourselves in a very powerful way. So we cannot see or think what we are not. We cannot desire what we cannot be. We're, we become trapped in our self-image um, and all the conditions that have been passed on by society and childhood. And I, again, I have to say, when I think about our indigenous communities and the people of my own community and the children of my own community, um, how that identity has been shaped by colonization and residential school and intergenerational trauma. That what was what we're really um, and again why this this method is, speaks to me is because it's restoring me to my most natural state and way of being. Um, and that we knew before contact that we had that freedom and we knew that we were connected to everything and we knew that that we could sit uh, we could drum or sing or or sit in vision or dance our vision uh, we had belief we had belief in the mysterious and we still do um, but our children have been just very disconnected from that understanding at this point yeah right and like like water on that mountain, just dripping. That's the way these proclamations work. The first proclamation is consciousness creates. Pragya nam brahma. Mm. Consciousness creates. So with, with this continuous idea in our mind, because we are so trapped in our self-image, we can't right now often Many of us can't even believe in the possibility that we could have what we want. Whether if it's whether it's feeling the way we want or doing something we want or having something we want, having a relationship we want, it's so hard to even imagine and actually see what it is that we want. It seems so far away. But these proclamations, they help us chip away at that former self-image that has formed all that dirt and muck from our entire childhood that's told us 
what we have to be, what we cannot be. It, it's created like silt, like a delta in our mind. And every way, everything we see in the world, everything we take in, gets filtered through that. Mm -hmm. So we, we are offering these tools as a way to erode that mountain that's been built of our self-image mm -hmm. and allow the water, our consciousness, to flow, flow freely and reveal our true self-image. Mm -hmm. Because we're all brilliant, we're all beautiful people. We, we all have the power to actually be and do and have what we want in this life. That is an inborn gift that the Creator birthed us with. And these proclamations are such beautiful tools. They come from a 5,000-year-old ancient tradition that has really tried through the test of time to allow us to believe in this idea that can seem, it, it, it's very simple, but it's so hard to do because we can't concentrate on that vision. I, so I want to share, I'm going to share another little story because I remember um, when I first started practicing the meditation, I, I would notice myself sort of spontaneously just finding joy in my meditation. And so I would notice that I'd be sitting there meditating and I would have, I would be overcome with joy and I'd have this, um, this smile on my face for no reason whatsoever, you know, because generally I'm kind of a tense person and very intense at times and I'm thinking a lot intellectually. And so I would be, I would just spontaneously be sitting there with this smile and joy, feeling this joy. And then I would notice my mind would come in again. And my mind would say, this isn't real. You have nothing to be happy about. You can't do this. And so I noticed that process of, of uh, having a daily practice. It, it's eroding that, the part of my mind that says, you can't have joy. You can't be joyous. And so I'm, uh, e even through tough circumstances and the ups and downs of life, I'm able to maintain and tap into Sometimes, some days it's harder than others, but I'm able to tap into that sense of joy for no other reason than I'm alive and experiencing life. So it's, it's just, it's so beautiful, but know that the mind um, is terrified, our ego, our mind is terrified of letting go <laughs> when we start to enter into these kinds of practices. Our mind says, no, and it wants to hold on for dear life. You'll notice, I notice that, and it's, it's, it seems irrational. It does. It seems yes. very irrational. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, yes, it does. So Solomon said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Mm. And I really love this quote. Beautiful. So, again, just what we've been saying, this self-image is a filter. All the thoughts that we think or capture from the universe gets filtered through our self-image before it can enter our heart. So if we can visualize actually working on the self-image to create the filter we want, then the things that we want, the visions, the aspirations, the dreams we have for our life, for our loved ones can actually come right into our heart and flourish there in that ocean of consciousness within us and be reflected clearly in the world around us without any disbelief or counter idea getting in the way. And I know this sounds like a very big idea, especially when so many of us are getting up and just trying to make it through the day, facing all the pains, all the hardships in our lives, in our work, with our loved ones. But it's our belief level that has to be raised for us to believe in this idea that we are worthy and we can have exactly what we want. So all the thoughts that you think or capture from the universe has to filter through your self-image before it can enter your heart. Um, 
And I, I think this is a it, this is a good place to talk about what the second the second uh, proclamation in the meditation is, which is the Sanskrit is tatamam ashi, and what that means is unity, all one which really is the very heart of indigenous life ways, that all, everything is one. There is no separation. Um, and what, what I love about this now, and I know Shauna and I have had conversations about this because she's interested in quantum physics too, <laughs> yes, <definitely>. uh, <laughs> that we live in an observer-created world and um, everything is manifest. Everything in the material world is manifested from thought. And they now know this. That we're, you know, matter, heart, it's all, it's all uh, the same source vibrating at a really high level. And so that second proclamation helps us to tap into this sense of oneness, um, our source, um, what, where we come from, what, what everything is made of. Mm -hmm. And it is incredible, for me that one was incredibly powerful when I started doing that one. When I when we when one starts at least the way I did it and what's recommended in the book is that we start with one at a time like one for a whole, five minutes for a whole week and then go to the next one and I, and I can remember going to that second one and and feeling I could actually feel my vibration changing in my body I could feel a, a, a difference in my own self um, and I find that Tata Vamashi. Uh, for me makes an incredible difference uh, in my relationships with people. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm seeing that I'm the same as you, and you're the same as you, and everything is spirit and consciousness, then suddenly I can understand you. Mm -hmm. Suddenly I know the deepest part of you. Suddenly that takes priority over this current dispute or argument that we're having. And perspective taking can begin. And we can start to be together on a common ground yeah. and work out what we need to work out from that place. I think this one has been um profound for me in terms of my ability to forgive myself and other people is this, uh, it's a reminder and not just a reminder but actually a, a, a sense of in my very beingness that we are all connected. I always knew that anyway but this this has allowed me to experience in a, in, in a different way and so it's allowed me to forgive myself when I make mistakes which I do every single day. But more importantly, it's allowed me to forgive other people in my life for um, some of the things that they've done to hurt or wound me. And it's been very, very freeing. Very freeing. So again, it's, it's the second proclamation uh, in the meditation, and it is incredibly powerful. So, mm -hmm. ta ta ashi. Yes? Do we have time for a question? Sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sure. So we've got somebody who's asked a question. It's, uh, she says, I really appreciate all of your sharing here and your focus on the power of the individual. And a question that is coming up for me is how th that this ignores systematic realities that exist. Mm -hmm. How does this frame acknowledge or incorporate this system systematic issue? It's a great question. So the question is, um, how does this, how do these ideas of the individual's power take into account systematic mm -hmm. influences? Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We just went to residential school, was it because yes. um, Indigenous people had a bad way of looking at the world, so they mm -hmm. brought it upon themselves? Mm -hmm. Or even look around the world, is that because of individuals that? Mm -hmm. They went through certain traumas, like as a collective. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, when I when I think about, I mean, and those are questions that come up for me. Well, if that's the case, then why do bad things happen to good people, mm -hmm. right? And I think there, it, it, that's a complex matter. Uh, and there, there, I, I, if you think about all the thoughts that you think or capture from the universe, has to fill through you through your self-image before it can enter your heart. That if we are not 
um, I mean, and especially where there's a dominant, a dominant way, a dominant belief system that can be so overpowering, and this is how I make sense of it, that we can get caught up into that. And so, how, how can I help you understand how I deal with this at a personal level, is mm -hmm. that, um, and actually I am just going to, I am going to share, I'm going to share a little okay. person, <laughs> personal to help make sense of this, because I, I have to make it personal mm -hmm. um, to understand the political as yeah. arena. It has to be. The personal has to, is political, <laughs> actually. Um, so um, my husband was diagnosed uh, with cancer in December. And there is a huge belief system around that particular disease. There's a lot of momentum around it. And um, at that point, I had to choose whether I was going to be drawn into the circumstances and the reality of the situation. Um, and the material reality of that situation that a lot of people believe in, um, or uh, would I, would I um, sit in meditation and manage the self-identity I had around that, and work with creating the circumstances that I wanted? And I will tell you, my husband's been working with this uh, meditation system as well and his how his, the way that he has navigated this people see him and they go like what the heck's going on with you you look amazing so it, it's and there's certain things that happen I mean there are no mistakes things happen for a reason and sometimes those turning points I mean for me when I look at what's happening in in our communities Yes, we've been through hell and back, but there's an awakening that's happening right now, and there is a wisdom and a knowledge that's been birthed through all of that that is so powerful, and it's gaining momentum. Uh, and that's how I make sense of that. But I, as an Indigenous woman, if I don't have um, the power of choice, mm -hmm. I have no freedom. And if you look at like people like Nelson Mandela, um, uh, Gandhi and other people that have been imprisoned, enslaved, you know, what got them through that? That, what we're talking about is what got them through that. Mm -hmm. So even in the worst of circumstances, we have the power to choose how we're going to perceive it. Yes. Um, there's a beautiful movie that may, some of you may have seen, but it's called um, A Beautiful, it's called A Beautiful Life, and it's about um, World War II, it's, um, there's a, a concentration camp in Italy and the son, dad is in with his son. Has anyone seen that? No. Well, this, the dad knows that, that likely they're going to die. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so he knows this. The mom is gone. And so what he does is he tells his little boy, he said, he tells his little boy that this is all a game. And he says, and the game is that, you see those guys in the uniform? He says, you have to hide from them no matter what. And whoever's the last person here at the end is the winner. And you're going to get this incredible prize. And so um, eventually the dad perishes, but this little boy keeps playing the game. And because he thinks it's a game, it's a beautiful movie, it brings tears to my eyes, because he thinks it's a game, he's able, he doesn't, his perception of the situation is not harmful to him, and he, he does get rescued at the end of the movie, but it was the way the dad protected him, mm -hmm. he didn't, he didn't sort of contaminate his way of thinking, he allowed him to have the, the freedom of seeing it in a way that wouldn't be harmful to him, so that's my explanation for it. Um, I don't know if I've answered the question or not, or <laughs> that, that's how I see it. And I think if, if we as Indigenous people don't have the, pop, the choice to see things the way we want to see them, if we are only creating based on conditions, we can't dream beyond those conditions. And I, I've said that before. I work with our families every single day and our parents, and I, I, I just had a conversation with my director about this. I said, our parents need to be able to dream again about what, who they want to be as parents, about what they want for their children, about what the possibilities are, as opposed to living in a world where they're only battling their circumstances and 
focused only on our circumstances. You know, we create from our heart, not from our mind. And so how do we engage the heart? Because this is very limiting. It's the idea where the identity lives. It's the heart we dream from. It's the heart we vision from. It's the heart that we truly manifest from. That's my explanation. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. What I would say um, from my experience, I, I actually work in a school that uh, defines itself as a structural school of social work. Mm -hmm. So the school um, actually focuses on structural oppressions. I, and I, I teach the introductory class for that. Um, so I don't see this work as contradictory to learning about being aware of the incredible oppressions that colonization has created. Mm -hmm. It's this work is not a denial of any of that. Mm -hmm. There's there's no there's no denial that um, there's just incredible structural injustices that have happened to indigenous peoples and um, minorities and women. And this work is actually a part of structural social work in my mind. That's, that's my, my way of viewing it because even uh, structural social work theory, we talk about the individual empowerment piece. That the structural work, there's, there's wonderful things that can happen doing collective work together. But if we don't work on this self-image, how are we going to believe in that greater vision for ourselves that has to tear apart our current circumstances? Yeah. So we've got another question here. <clears throat> That's um, great. What might be the danger of focusing on the individual in terms of blame mm -hmm. um, and the connection between the individual realities and systematic realities? So I get it. It's almost like blaming the victim. Like mm -hmm. things aren't working out. Where are you thinking? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's an yes. issue with the way you're looking at things instead yes. of it's a much bigger picture. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I do, it's a great question. So, so the question is, just so I understand it, you. is um, where does self-blame come in to the picture when we're talking about we have this power to create? Yes. And we're talking about individuals. individuals. Sort yeah. of like, well, if you have all this power as an individual, what about the whole system and what it's done? Yes. Another, you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so, oh, if things are going wrong. Maybe they've been attacked. Maybe horrible things have happened yes. or trauma. Yes. Is it because they're not thinking in a good way? Yeah. So the risk there, that's what she's talking about. Right. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk, I talk a little bit Am about. Am I saying that right? Let me know if I'm explaining it wrong. <laughs> I'm going to talk just a little bit from a personal lens, through a personal lens, and then I share. Yeah, then you can add. Well, I mean, being someone who um, is, I guess I, I could have described myself as a child as a bit of a victim of the system and having mm -hmm. experienced a lot of different trauma. Um, that prior to my um, recognizing, my innate power to make mm -hmm. choices and, and to change my perceptions about mm -hmm. things, um, to forgive. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think that um, blame can be a natural go-to place, mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly am no stranger to self-blame, for sure. Um, but it wasn't until I really started to know who I, know myself mm -hmm. um, and my true source and that my self-image started to change, that I experienced true freedom from that. And, and so it's, yes, those experiences shape who we are. No doubt they shape our identity, they shape the way we perceive ourselves, they shape the way we perceive our world, they shape what we believe. Um, I mean, I think that's the real injustice of, of, of this, is that um, those experiences, childhood experiences we have, Growing up, the messages were given by society, our families, and the world. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think that I learned to blame myself in those systems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this particular system freed me from that, to see that we all have individual will, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what our circumstances are. So it's not a denial, like uh, Indrani said, of the horrible injustices that have been done and continue to be done in the world. Um, but when I think of blame, I, I learn to blame myself in those, in those other, in my family system, in, in the school system, in the, uh, and it was when, it was really when I, I came to know my true identity as a, a spiritual infinite being that I was free out from that. Do you want to add to that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I would say for my for my what I learned is that the idea that we have the power to create um, also goes along with the idea that the universe is caring for us and loving us and that when, when something goes wrong in our life and someone else has harmed us, that's, that's their responsibility. We haven't caused that. Each person is responsible for their own actions and, and when we're working, this, this is such an important question, there's actually, my mind is going in four different directions, <laughs> so um, thank, thank you, you for asking, thank you yeah. for asking. Yeah. this Very is good. such an important question, yeah. I'm, I'm just deciding which route to go, <laughs> but what I would say, is just for the idea that we have the power to create with our thought, and what goes along with that is an incredible sense of compassion and love and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And when harm has been done to us, it, it's never that it's, it's our fault that we cause that. It's the way, the way I understand the teaching is that I am being cared for and that even the painful experiences that have happened in my life have been there to help me become whole. Mm -hmm. They haven't been there to hurt me, though I have experienced tremendous pain through them. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that for myself has been incredibly helpful to me. And it's never about blame though. And this this it it is such an important question because it, it's incredibly irresponsible for anyone to use this idea to blame anyone mm -hmm. for um, for abuse that has happened to any individual. Yeah. And I feel very strongly yeah. about that. It, it, it's, it's, many people are abused still in horrendous ways, and it's never their fault, ever, ever. This teaching is about us learning about our own self-image and transforming that and discovering what we want to be and, and beginning to dream about the possibilities we can have in our circumstances despite what has happened to us, that yes. everyone can, can yes. regain that empowerment and yes. that power, despite what has happened. Yes. Um, and the social justice work still continues. Yeah. It's not in negation of, it's along with. So I just know for myself personally, um, at the point where I am at right now, um, I think of it as uh, a tool for resiliency. Mm -hmm. So, um, in my own life, things have not been perfect, and there's been some pretty horrific traumas. Yeah. But for me, this is—it's like being an athlete. 
I need to have things in my toolkit. I need to get sleep. I need to eat healthy, lots of water. Mm -hmm. um, my mindset, where's my mindset at? My keeping track of my emotions, because all that helps me to be the best I can be, mm -hmm. yeah. along with some other things. So that helps me with my resiliency. Sometimes I'll get tripped, I'll get taken out, different things will happen. I will get injuries, I will have owies. Yes. Because the game can be rough sometimes. Yeah. But that helps me recover yeah. and bounce back in a better way. So that's these practices, that's what it makes me think of, like a tool for resiliency. It doesn't make it perfect, but it helps me bounce back better mm -hmm. and helps me be the best that I can be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, I love that because resiliency is a perfect word because that mm -hmm. that's, is what we're talking about. That it's Our resiliency actually comes from the heart. Mm -hmm. and our ability to dream and, and to be passionate about life despite what has happened to us and, and that's where that's born from and absolutely that's what the meditation and visual that the four steps to meditation and visualization that's what it gives us back yeah is that that ability that capacity our capacity to be resilient to continue to believe in our own wholeness mm -hmm. and in our own power mm -hmm. and ability to be who we want to be. I, I, yeah, I know we've got lots of other slides to go through, but I just want to add that my own, what I would call my own catastrophes in life, the biggies, <laughs> um, certainly have been turning points in my life. And um, I've been able, I've been fortunate enough um, to be able to make use of those situations so that, that it propels me on um, to greater wholeness, mm -hmm. greater fulfillment. Um, does it mean that it's not difficult? Does it mean that I haven't felt wounded? Um, no, of course not. Mm -hmm. I'm human and, and yeah, it, it, that part is tough, but um, I'm moving through those things less scathed, unscathed, mm -hmm. you know, um, with joy still in my heart, able to dream and, and experience, like I said, that just experience that joy that comes from being alive. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing. That is a gift. That is a beautiful gift. We do have another question. Okay. Despite the trauma we experience, the commission of autocentricities, correct me, atrocities, 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 thank you, uh, committed by others, we do define our self and not allow our experiences and our traumas and inadequacies of others to define who who I am, she says. Beautiful. Yeah. It's a beautiful statement. It is. It is. It's a beautiful like Thank proclamation you. of something. Yeah. Could you say it again, Shauna? I will try. <laughs> <laughs> I really like it. Multitasking here. Um, despite the trauma we experience, the commission of atrocities committed by others, we can define ourself and not allow experiences and traumas and the inadequacies of others to define who we are. Yeah, absolutely. That's powerfully said. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I guess we have to get going. I know. People are Let, really let's, engaged. Let's go a little bit further and then we'll stop again. Okay. Because yeah. yeah. there's some okay. beautiful, there's a couple of beautiful stories that we want to share about. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. That, that I think you're really going to love. And that's going to be, we want you to walk away feeling like we've given you something to work with. And so we need to get to those pieces so people yes. feel like, I've got something I can work with now. So yeah. should we go so forward keep, to the stories right now? I think we should. So yeah, we'll I think we should. Going with the questions, and when we have a break next, and we'll read them out. So whatever comes to mind, just write it down. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, great. Um, so, go, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so the question now that we need to, to look at, and this is where we're going to use story and metaphor to, to help uh, impart understanding. Uh, is how is our self-image formed? And that was a great segue because we, we were talking about some of the negative ways that our self-image can be formed based on early experiences. And um, the way that uh, Mr. Sen has taught us how to share this is, is through the story um, of the elephant. And it's, mm -hmm. I love elephants. They're the most beautiful, majestic creatures on the face of the planet and smart and gentle um, and loving. But the elephant is the most powerful and biggest mammal on the earth living today. Uh, it's enormous. I mean, look, look at them. 
They're, they're so powerful and so strong. Oh, oh there we go. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the elephant can tear down trees and push down walls effortlessly. It is used by its owners to pick up huge logs and tree trunks from the river and load them on transport trucks. They're used for work in places like Thailand. You'll see the back of his leg, the left hind leg, has a chain, chain on it. See, in the very back, he's chained there. So every night, and from a baby, huh? so since, from, from, since the elephant's been a baby, um, it has been tied to a three and a half foot pole that is a flimsy little chain and a pole. Um, and as an adult, it's released to work during the day, but every night it's put back onto that pole. Every single night, that chain and that pole. And it could easily pull, it could easily pull free if it wanted to, but it never breaks free. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Only when they're playing. Only yeah. when they're playing, they don't realize, and then they go back to be at night time. At night to have the chain on the leg again. Because, well, let, let, I'm going to actually ask the question of the audience since they're so interactive. Mm -hmm. So why does it go back every night? If it, if it can have its freedom at any time, it's so strong, it can knock people out of its way, it can pull that chain out of the ground, why would it go back every night? Whoops, if it dies. Any comments? Oh, somebody's writing. Okay. okay. <laughs> if not, I was just saying Johnny can answer. <laughs> I think she knows the answer. <laughs> <laughs> she does. <laughs> it's conditioned. It's conditioned. It's yes. an image. Yes, hundred percent. It's because identity. it's oppressed, and it's learned to be oppressed. Yeah, mm -hmm. its image, its self identity has identity. been formed. Yeah. Yes, the identity has been formed, mm -hmm. and so even though freedom is right there, it doesn't take its freedom. Yeah. Yes, it's comfortable there. That's that's what it's familiar with. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So it never breaks free. It could break free with a gentle nudge. It wouldn't even feel the pull. It doesn't even try to break free. Why doesn't it break free? I was ahead of my time there. <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't it break free? When it was a baby, it was tied to this three and a half foot pole with a chain to one of its hind legs. It tried with all its might to break free then. But it was not strong enough to pull the pole out of the ground. After trying with all its might, it gave up. So it now just pulls logs out of the river for a living, even though it's the mightiest, strongest animal living on land today. It's stuck to a three and a half foot pole. Look at the size of that elephant, that majestic creature, tied to this three and a half foot, foot pole, and it stays stuck there, holding him captive. Why? As one of the audience members rightly said, its self-image is formed. Its belief system and its memory are formed. Its mindset is stuck to that three and a half foot pole. But our strength is in the mind. It's not in the body. It's in our consciousness. So how do we train our mind? How do we, how do we contend with this self-image to free ourselves to have and be those visions that we truly desire? We need to emotionally prepare ourselves. 
And the tools that we're talking about in this book offer this emotional preparation for the self-image that we desire to free our mind from that three and a half foot pole. Our circumstances do not make us, they only, as James Allen said, reveal us to ourselves. When we are trapped in our current self-image, in this filter, Free the mind from dependency on circumstances. Release the heart from the intellect and let it free to think the thoughts you want to think regardless of the circumstances. Go ahead. <laughs> now we're, this is what happens to us. We're learning to work together too. Right? So I was just going to say, when we when I read that, release the heart from the intellect and let it free to think the thoughts that it wants to think, regardless of the circumstances, that that is where we need to be able to feel our aching for all of the beautiful things in life. Our aching for, for joy and um, life itself, you know, all of the beauty of life. That our, where our spirits are just aching to experience this. If only the mind would allow. It's just our natural state. I get goosebumps when I say that, so I know when I say things like that, that it's, and I, I, I mean, my mind has been well conditioned, and I'll tell you, this has been a, an inner conflict for me between my mind and my heart, and actually one of my favorite elders told me many years ago, Denise, the longest journey you'll ever make is the one from, the head, from your head to your heart. And I will never forget her. I will never forget her telling me that. I don't even think I knew what she meant at the time. Mm -hmm. But now I do. Mm -hmm. And so it's like my heart has this ability to experience all the beauty in life. And then my mind comes in and shuts it down. Mm -hmm. And so I'm learning to free my mind by meditating, visualizing, visualizing uh, the four steps of visualization. It's been so freeing. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And that's why the question, coming back, constantly asking us, as Denise said, that question, those questions need to haunt us. Who am I? When we come back to who am I, am I this pain that I've experienced? Am I this conflict that this individual is bringing me? Or am I something else? Am I expanded much bigger than this? Am I the whole universe? Can I be this whole wonder of the world that we live in and move and breathe and have my being from there? So that's, that's what we're talking about, constantly coming back. Who am I? Who am I? Because we often think that all we are is our present thought. And you know, we actually are only using about 5% of our mind capacity. So what do you think the rest of the 95% is for? We are talking about tapping into the rest of that 95. 95%. Our imagination is the most powerful aspect that we have. Yeah. yeah. And I do in my work, in my own community, and, and traveling around, I see the suffering that's happening. And that's why I wanted to share this, because it's, it's been profound for me. It's been so profound, and um, when we're dependent only on our circumstances and on our intellect, we suffer. We live in an anxious state, but when we can tap into something greater, our heart, um, the universe, it, there's another way available to us, but to all of us. We're all created equal in this way. We all have this capacity, potential. Absolutely. Yeah. Denise and I speak about this not from a removed place, but by coming through trauma and pain with this work. So I just, I love this line that that elephant actually has the power to have dominion over all of its world. And the least is that three and a half foot pole. 
which it feels is its captive. We all have our three and a half foot poles. For sure. Yeah. They all do. We have to identify them, pull them out, and free ourselves. How do we do that? <laughs> oh, it's good. It was in unison. <laughs> <laughs> and we all have our, our, our small worlds that we need to think bigger. And we, it's very hard to do until someone can come along and show us that there is a bigger world. <clears throat> and that sometimes we think that person's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what are you talking about? You're crazy. Yes. <laughs> So at first, we don't believe when a person says the world is bigger. Yeah. But out of curiosity and or sarcastic skepticism, to prove him wrong, we check it out. Then in experiencing it, we open up our mind and enter the path of joy. Before freedom comes, oh. so all freedom has to be fought and won. It's not easy. We know that. We all have our battle scars. Um, it's not easy, but it's, it's glorious when we're able to do it. Yes. It's beautiful when we're able to do it and to make that commitment to ourselves. Yes. Yeah. We will have to free our mind from, depend, from our dependency from our circumstances before freedom comes. We cannot, we cannot, and that really is um, what quantum physics is, is based on, is that we cannot create from our current circumstances. We must be able to tap into the infinite to create. Because then we are creating more of the same thing. So we, to try and create something different, we have to become something different. So as long as I believed, and it was, I'll tell you, what, what this has done for me is that I, I, it's made me aware of the belief system I had running in my subconscious that I wasn't aware of. And so there were these thoughts that were just running 24-7 in my, in my consciousness that were based on my life experiences that were... Even though I'm a successful person and I'm generally happy, there were some negative belief thoughts, uh, negative beliefs there that caused me a lot of anxiety, actually. Fear, anxiety, struggle, all of these things that we grow up with, believing. Um, and I noticed one day that I was living in the future, that I would find joy in the future someday, that I would finally be able to enjoy my life in the future someday. When I became aware of that, I realized I can't look around at what's going on in my life and then say, well, I'm going to let that dictate how I'm feeling. I need to find a state of joy now, today, no matter what's happening, and start to create from that place. And what I found in doing that is that I've been able to manifest different results and transform things and patterns in my life that were chronic patterns, negative patterns. So it's not that the belief systems are our fault, coming back to that really potent blame question. It's not that it's our fault, but that we are deeply impacted by, by those belief systems, by the way that we've been treated, by, by the harm that's been done. And we can choose a different self-image. That's, that's, that's such a beautiful gift we have in us, in spite of mm -hmm. what we've been told of who we are. Mm -hmm. so we've got a few minutes left and then uh, we need to wrap it up. Okay. So make sure you're sending any questions in so I can bring them up before we close. What so let's, we're going to just tell one more short story. Okay. I think that's that's a good a good way to go. So this is a lovely story. Um, so this is a story of the frog of the well and the frog of the ocean. It's also in the book, I want to say. It's in the book. Yes. Yeah. So there was this frog born in a well, raised in a well, didn't know anything existed outside the well. You see, 
that well is that frog's whole world. And then one day, a frog of the ocean came to visit that frog of the well. And of course, we know there's no frogs in the ocean, so it's just a story. And the frog of the well asked, how big is your ocean? It is bigger than the well, said the frog of the ocean. The frog of the well laughed, how much more bigger than this well? Twice the size, three times the size, very condescendingly. The frog of the ocean replied, millions of wells like this will not even suffice. It will get lost in my ocean. I have to see it to believe it. They went on a journey to the ocean together to show the frog of the well what the size of this ocean would be. An explosion happened. Can you imagine what the explosion was? As they approached the ocean, and the frog of the well saw the ocean, his mind exploded. He realized there are other worlds and other dimensions. <laughs> so we want to help bring our consciousness from the frog of the well to the frog of the ocean and increase the size of our world. So his mind opened up. He was ready to enter into his own being and dive into the infinite power of his stillness. And the stillness, um, when you enter into the stillness of meditation, you are like the caterpillar going into the cocoon and going through the process that that caterpillar needs to go to to become the butterfly. And remember that that caterpillar has no idea ever that it will become a butterfly. It does not know that. It can't even imagine that. But the stillness of being in that cocoon is the process of the transformation, the metamorphosis um, that has to happen. And that's what this process can do for you. That's what meditation can do. That's what visualization can do for you. It can help you um, to metamorphosize in that way and become the beautiful butterfly. It is possible. I, I'm yes. living proof of that. As am I. Yeah. As am I. That everything's there in you that you need. Yes. Right now. And to break up that soul self-image is like a process of moving from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Mm -hmm. We come into the existence as a caterpillar and we are required to come a butterfly. So this awareness of a caterpillar, can you imagine that caterpillar? Does the caterpillar even know that she's going to become a butterfly? Yet yeah, that's her destiny. All they do is eat, crawl, and eat, and excrete. <laughs> <laughs> it's not aware of the possibilities. It's a victim of the birds. <laughs> And then it realizes it has to know more. It enters into her stillness and forms a cocoon around herself with her own body fluids, visions all the possibilities, and that leads to a self-awareness, her power, into a monarch butterfly. Oh, that's a very good way to end. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> So thank you, everybody. Um, I think the I can go to the last slide. It has the, it, will people get these slides? This will be available, right? Yeah. Okay. Right to the, yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, the book, yeah, so the book, it has all the, like all the things we talked about yeah. are in detail in here. And then the meditation CD is the music and the mm -hmm. guided visualization, guided meditations that you can listen to that are okay. powerful very powerful and so you can get those there and then as I said Indrani and I are planning on doing a two-day workshop on this so if you're interested people can email mm -hmm. they can email us and you're and, on Facebook and I'm on Facebook Point <laughs> by Consulting absolutely yes. we'd be happy to chat with you and thank you so much I know there was a lot of information okay. to share today yes and and I just want to say one last thing <clears throat> thank you that um, for anyone that's interested um, if you go to that website 
Um, Mr. Tolshi Sen has also made available three um, audio recordings for the participants okay. on oh, this wonderful. on this talk, and um, maybe I can uh, send you the the. Yes, information. So we can put that on the web page. The information. Sure, yes. Okay, I've had to get there. That'd great. be great. Thank you very much. Well, thank for your, you, everyone. For your time. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. I'm just going to bring you up to date on what we've got coming. We've got uh, Baby Friendly Learning Circle coming up April 13th. Um, we're going to have a traditional plant practitioner. That's Carolyn Victor on April 26th. Um, a male Indigenous youth. Um, session and that's going to be done with the Langley School Drift's Aboriginal program on May 5th. We have another um, session on co-occurring disorders with Ernie Cardo and that's May 24th and Mark Point will be joining us again and he's going to be talking about how grandparents can increase Aboriginal student success. And so go to our uh, UBC Learning Circle website and register. We'd love to see you again and thank you so much to our guests. Thank you for coming. Thank Just appreciate it very much. And thank you to Davina behind the scenes. And yes. look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you.